Hey there, Osa Beacon Vacations. Welcome back to another review, this time of A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2, Freddy's Revenge. Freddy's Revenge is a sequel that I think is honestly pretty underrated. I can see why people don't really care for the film, but I don't understand why it's lumped in with the other really awful horror sequels, like... Halloween 5 and 6 and Resurrection and Hellraiser Bloodline and, you know, Nightmare on Street Part 5. And I don't get why Part 5 is not bashed. I mean, Part 5 is terrible to me. I'd rather watch Nightmare on Street Part 2, Freddy's Revenge, any day of the week over Part 5. Because Part 5 is just, I think it's honestly a pretty sad and pathetic Nightmare on Elm Street sequel, and I'll get into that soon enough later, but mainly because Robert England just doesn't look like his heart is in the role because he's exhausted, and it shows. Here, at least, he definitely has more energy, um, yeah, but he's not in the film that much. It's about 13 minutes of screen time for Freddy, but he doesn't make it, but, you know, uh, the, the screen time he's on is definitely memorable and definitely is pretty strong. Um... I don't think it's as bad as, as the worst. Of, I don't think it belongs to be on the list of worst horror sequels. That's just me personally. I don't think it, it, it's kind of feel that I don't love it as much as, for example, Halloween three, because I love season of the witch. I'm a big fan of that movie, but I, I still like Nightmare on Elm Street part two, Freddy's revenge. Uh, I, I've always kind of had liked it. I mean, the first time I saw it was on VHS. I didn't mind it. Then I watched it again on DVD. Didn't mind it then. And then I watched it for the third time recently on the Blu-ray that's on this set. And it was... I didn't mind it again. I pretty much feel the same way about the film as I always have. I think it's an above-average, entertaining uh, sequel. I think it has a lot... There's a lot of things going for it. But then again, there's, a, there's some problems that weigh it down for me that bring the film down considerably. It brings it down from a really good movie to just a a, a, a solid, alright, above average movie. But that's just for me personally. Um, this is a sequel to Wes Craven didn't want to do because he read the script by David Chaskin and he didn't like the whole aspect of Freddy going out of the dream world and into our world. He didn't like that concept. And so he basically pretty much separate himself as far as he could from from the film um and he, he did, you know he didn't like the fact that he was you know freddie was manipulating the protagonist into committing the murders either so he didn't like that either um and he wasn't really that supportive of the film have the of nightmare on elm street becoming a franchise anyway he wanted it to be more of a just for example just more just a standalone film he wanted the film to be a standalone movie uh, writer David Chaskin, he deliberately wrote the screenplay to contain homoerotic subtexts. And so, when you look at the film, you're like, oh my god, this is going to be like the gayest movie ever. Uh, you know, it was like the gayest horror film I've ever seen. I've seen gayer. I, I really have. I've seen stuff a lot gayer than this. There's one there's called The Switch Killer, where it's this guy who's a transvestite who's killing people. And then there was the first ever gay horror film called Hellbent. That's a lot gayer than Never Know Street Part 2. I'm just saying. Um, but anyway, it was intentional. So it's not one of those unintentionally gay movies. It, it, was, it, was, inten it was intentionally homoerotic by David Chaskin, but Jack Shoulder didn't, didn't know. He went into this completely without any knowledge that this is a, had homoerotic subtext. Um, and I guess they also, New Line was trying to be really cheap with this sequel. I mean, the budget isn't that much. I mean, it's a pretty low budget sequel. It's about $3 million. And they wanted to go even cheaper because they originally were intending not to even bring Robert England back. Yeah, I know this is crazy, isn't it? You can't have Freddy without Robert England, and they were like, no, they don't want. They didn't want to pay him the raise. They don't want to pay him the money, the the higher salary that he deserves. And they actually casted some guy to play Freddy, other than than Robert England. And the screen tests were terrible. The guy just sucked. Uh, people who worked on the film said he was too Frankenstein-ish to for Freddy. 
And so they eventually relented and they begrudgingly uh, gave Robert the money he deserved and he returned as Freddy. Uh, so it was it was crazy. The, the, the sequel could have been a lot worse, folks. It could have had no Robert England as Freddy Krueger. It had some guy who's just a, F a Freddy Krueger impersonator who does a terrible job of it. So, um, and uh, in the film... You, you see Robert England in not only the scenes with Freddy, but he's also in the beginning of the movie in uh, during Jesse's uh, dream sequence while, you know, he's in the you know, riding the bus. Uh, there's Robert England without his makeup driving the bus. So I, I, when I saw it, I didn't notice that until like the third time I saw the movie. Then I'm like, hey, that's Robert England. <laughs> Watching the Blu-ray, I'm like, that's Robert England. He's driving the bus. Uh, so... Yeah, so Robert, he's in the film about 13 minutes. You could count maybe his little cameo, which is maybe about 30 seconds in the beginning. Um, but it makes all the difference in the world because the film would not not be memorable. No one, no one would really remember the film. It wouldn't have a cult following if Robert wasn't in it. And also, it wouldn't have a cult following either if it didn't have the male lead uh, in Mark Patton. And Mark Patton actually is gay. And there's nothing wrong with that. And... I think he did a good job uh, performance-wise in this film, and and sadly though, I think he's he has HIV. I believe I believe he does have HIV. He's HIV positive, and uh, he's not in the best of health. And uh, he's uh, working on a documentary about Nightmare on Elm Street Two and the, and the legacy, and you know why he quit acting, called Scream Queen. And uh, I, I really, I hope it gets funded through Kickstarter. I'm gonna put a link down below in the video description uh, for the Kickstarter campaign. Um, I think it's still being funded right now. It could be wrong. It could be already over. If that's the case, and it didn't get fun it did not get funded. That's really lame. But um, it looks like it'll be an interesting documentary, and it seems like Nightmare on Elm Street 2 has become a fan favorite of the gay community and you know hey whatever floats your boat I mean that's cool I mean I think that's a really you know that's fine with me I mean one of my best friends is gay uh, Damien Sage you know I, I've known for years and he's a really nice guy and uh, I've really appreciated my friendship with him over the years um, and uh, there's nothing wrong with that so um, I don't think the film sucks or it's terrible because it has homoerotic subtexts. Some of it's a little bit too much, though, for my taste, especially the S&M stuff with Coach Schneider. Um, but yeah, I just thought it was kind of funny about the whole concept of the New Line going in with not no Robert England and then going with a male lead who kind of acts like a screen queen, and that was intentional by David Chaskin. Um, and this is the only Nightmare on Elm Street film with a male lead. Which I think is, it's another thing that makes the film stand out. I mean, it's got a male lead in it. So it was nice to see that. I know some people said he acted too feminine. And in some ways, yeah. But in other ways, not so, not really that much. Um, I, 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 thought Dave, I thought Mark Patton actually did a good job acting in this film. Uh... And I did buy the romance between him and Lisa. I actually did. I thought it was actually... I felt actual chemistry between him and Kim Myers. So, he wasn't originally the first choice. I mean, they they were they considered uh, Michael J. Fox to play Jesse. But he had no time because of Back to the Future and Teen Wolf, which were all made the same year, 1985. Can you imagine that? Now we're on Street Part 2, Freddy's Revenge, as Michael J. Fox as Jesse. They probably would have had to change up some of the homoerotic subtext. It really wouldn't work with, with MJ. With MJ, but I just thought it was funny. It was just that image of Michael J. Fox as as uh, Jesse, and uh, Brad Pitt and John Stamos and Christian Slater were all auditioned for the role of Jesse and didn't get it. Mark Patton beat out Brad Pitt, John Stamos, and Christian Slater. So yeah, Mark Patton beat out Brad Pitt. Uh, for Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2, Freddy's Revenge. So I just thought that was kind of an interesting bit of, bit of trivia there. Yeah, the whole sequence where Freddy terrorizes the pool party, people had a problem with it. 
I, I thought they thought it was the most ridiculous sequence of Freddy, and I'm like, they just thought it was just going too far. And I'm, I liked it, and I, I liked that sequence. Uh, I thought it was really cool to see Freddy in the real world killing people. I thought that was cool. That's just me personally. Um, would, would I prefer him to stay in the dream world? Absolutely, because that enables him to go all out and do these and very ingenious kills and come up with these very imaginative ways to rise the body count, which you can't really do while you're in the real world. So it's very limited in that aspect, but it becomes more of a traditional slasher film in that regard. And, and I didn't mind it when it came to that. And, and I'm like, you're going to cry foul at that, but the idea of Jesse be basically becoming Freddy or Freddy coming out through of his chest and leaving behind Jesse's husk, that's fine. But, oh, it's going too far and Freddy's killing kids at a pool party. I mean, that just that just doesn't make any sense to me. Does does not compute, so to speak. Uh, I guess his infamous dance scene was, was based on a risky business dance sequence, which is, which is pretty funny. And, um... Nancy, the character of Nancy, who you actually, they do mention her. It's not like they completely forget about Nancy Thompson, Heber Langenkamp. She's mentioned in the in a diary in the film where uh, that Jesse finds in, in the house that he's living in. Because he's moved in and he's living in the Nancy's house. And I, I guess the Thompsons have moved out since then. And speaking of Nancy, the film was, the script was written in New Line had no intention of bringing back Heather Lankenkamp, which I'm really sh shocked. So not only, they weren't planning on bringing back Freddy, you know, they weren't planning on bringing back Robert England to play Freddy, they weren't planning on bringing back Heather Lankenkamp back as Nancy either. Which um, doesn't even approach her, didn't even even bother. They just gave a little bit of a reference in the, with the diary, and then, and then you know, the and people are lucky that New Line even let that happen. Which is kind of ironic when you think about it in retrospect, because this is the film now. You know, they're trying to separate themselves from the first movie, and then this is the movie that's completely retconned and is no, and at all. It's not even part of the canon, according to a lot of people, and into the creators and Wes and so forth and so on. So it is kind of ironic. This is the film that tried to do like, oh, we're not like that movie. We're just a different sequel, and then. And then it, it was retconned out of existence, pretty much. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. Um, even though it's got a pretty bad reputation nowadays, it was a big hit. It made $29.9 million. It made twice as much as the original did in a box office. So it was a, a, a box office success. Um I mean, I mean, box office isn't automatically equal quality, but it definitely was a film that was successful in the box office. And I guess it was a really popular movie in Europe because Europeans caught the sexual overtones and they loved it. And it was also when the film producers knew that they had a franchise. And... Uh, Another little bit of trivia here it deals with the score, which is one thing I want to mention real quick before I go into like the rest of the cast and the crew and talk about you know the the plot synopsis and everything. Give my final rating on the film. The score is really underrated. If if you don't like the film, that's fine. I, I can understand why it's got issues with tone. It's got the homoerotic subtext. It's not everybody's cup of tea. It, it's it's the it. It takes the nightmare out of a nightmare in Elm Street. And so I can see why some people are, are big fans of the film. But Christopher Young's score is phenomenal. And I think even people who aren't even a fan of the movie can even admit that yeah, that was, that was a really good score. And it didn't even incorporate Charles Bernstein's theme music from the first film. It was like it was the first Nightmare on Elm Street film and probably the only one to really do that. To have its own score unique for the film. And Christopher Young did a really excellent job creating a lot of mood and atmosphere with his music. And his music itself is wonderful to listen to on its own. And it's 
I definitely say this it's one of Christopher Young's most underrated scores. I mean, everyone points out the Hellraiser and and, and so forth, and I love the score to Hellraiser, but I, I got to be honest, I like the score for Nightmare on Elm Street Part Two and, and The Fly Two, another underappreciated sequel, more than, for example, Hellraiser. Even though I love that score, it's just that I, I point, I, I tend to gravitate more towards those scores. I think they're they're obscure scores that should be appreciated more than they are. Anyway, of course, the film stars Matt, Mark Patton as Jesse Walsh, Kim Myers as Lisa Weber. Kim was casted because of her strong resemblance to Meryl Streep. So I'm not alone because I, whenever I see her, I'm like, man, she looks a lot like Meryl Streep, but a little bit hotter. Because And I always had a crush on her since I was a kid because I remember I saw the VHS because I, I borrowed it from my aunt and I always had a crush on her. So... I, I, I definitely do think she looks pretty fine, so to speak, in, in Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2. Robert England comes back as Freddy Krueger. Robert Russler plays Ron Grady. Robert Russler went into uh, the audition at last moment, at the last moment after he fil uh, got done filming Weird Science with his friend Robert Downey Jr. And he drove in the car, and then they did the audition, and he got the role of Grady. Clue Gulliger plays uh, Jesse's dad. The performance is all right, but the character sucks. I hate this character. I'll get into it more in depth later. Uh, Hope Lang plays Cheryl Wall. She's all right. Chrissy Clark plays his sister, Angela. Marshall Bell plays Coach Schneider, who happens to be in SN into SNM, and he's really uh, into. It's kind of into fucking boys, so that's really for you know. It's kind of into that and young boys, just really uncomfortable. Uh, and then you know you have a few other actors and actresses as well, um, like Sydney Walsh who plays uh, Carrie. Um, the film is directed by Jack Shoulder, whom I'm a really big fan of as a director. I love his his work for The Hidden, excellent movie. And uh, I also enjoyed his work for Alone in the Dark, which is one of the first New Line films. And uh, the producer, Robert Shea, he went out to Jack to direct this movie because of, you know, he'd been working with New Line for a while. He directed one of their first films, Alone in the Dark, he had already had an established relationship with them. So he was like, all right, you know, I want, you know, Jack, I want you to handle this. And I think he did an amazing job directing this film. I think in some aspects it even rivals Wes's direction in A Nightmare on Elm Street. I know blasphemy, but seriously, I mean, there's there's some really great shots in this film that are really uh, underrated and, and overlooked and underappreciated, um, especially the shot where he pans throughout the house, pans up the stairs, pans around the, the, the hallway and everything. It's a really well set up shot, and it, it, I love the way he shoots the location of the abandoned steel mill uh at the uh, in the in in the end of the film during the climax, and uh, it, it's very gothic, very creepy, very eerie, very well done. And Jack Shoulder did a great job helming the film and making it his own. Uh, the screenplay by David David Chaskin is, is solid for the most part. Uh, I like the way he handles how Freddy comes back to life. Uh, I never really had a problem with him coming into the real world or. Because uh, I it's, I understood that this film, according to uh, IMDb, says it takes place in '86, but I disagree with that because uh, there's a line of dialogue that specifically says that uh, five years have passed since the events in the first film. So it's five years later, not two, and this is and no one's afraid of Freddy. No, barely anyone know who knows who he is. And Jesse moves into the house and becomes susceptible to Freddy, you know, this whatever lingering soul or spirits left of Freddy. And I guess if you kind of look at the ending, shock ending of A Nightmare on Elm Street and see it as just that, a shock ending, it doesn't really hold a lot of weight story-wise. And that the story ended when Nancy took away his power by saying she doesn't believe in him anymore. I take all the power away from you. I'm not afraid of you anymore, Freddy. And she took, takes all that away from him. If you believe in that sort of aspect of the story, 
then it makes sense that he wouldn't be able to just right off the bat just jump into people's dreams and start killing them because no one's afraid of him anymore. But nobody nobody fears Freddy. Nobody really even knows he exists, and he needs to get power. He needs to gain more power in order to to terrify people in their dreams again and to kill them. So it, I think it makes logical sense that the next step would be that he would have to find a way to get into the real world again, terrify people there, and make them dream about him again and have nightmares about him and make it so he's relevant. And so I, I like how they handle that with the whole way of Freddy manipulating Jesse to the point where there are moments where Freddy will kill some people while Jesse's watching and other ones where he'll just physically take over Jesse's body. And the way they handle it, uh, I, I know Wes didn't like it, he thought it was just an excuse for a special effect, but I really like it. I always thought this concept was really, really inventive and really ingenious and really cool. The idea of Jesse becoming Freddy and and yeah, his finger claws or, you know, his claws, you know, they're actual blades that come out of his fingertips and the whole scene where he rips out of Jesse's body and kills Grady. Yeah, that was a really well done sequence. Great practical makeup effects. I, I love the shot where Jack Shoulder shoots it from, you know, uh, Jesse's screaming mouth. Then you see Freddy's eye uh, blinking in, you know, in his mouth. And there's a lot of really good effects for such a low budget. It's the $3 million budget and they did a good job with that. Um, I like that. I thought it was, it, it also made you sympathize with, with Freddy, which is almost impossible, but in a way that makes more sense than like the remake, which try to make you sympathize with Freddy by, oh, you know, he was, maybe he was innocent, which is a bunch of bullshit. Here you sympathize with Freddy because he is also partly Jesse and you care about Jesse and you want him to save his soul. So when you want him to, you know get things going and work and, and, and work out with Lisa. So you automatically feel for, for Freddie and it adds this whole more extra suspense because, Oh, now we can't just willy nilly kill Freddie. You can't, you can't shoot him with a shotgun in the real world. You can't do that. Cause there's actually Jesse is a part of Freddie. So that adds to the film. In my opinion, it doesn't detract from it. Uh, those aspects of the film script I have no problem with. I think they're actually really handled really well by David Chaskin. The homoerotic undertones can be fun, like the scene where he's where Jesse's dancing and cleaning up his room and playing with the with the uh, the toy that pops the ball out, like and he's got it right at his crotch, which is just totally obviously a reference to him blowing a load. Uh, but you know, it, it, pop goes the dick, and you know, it is what it is. Um, and of course, the scene where he goes in Grady's room and he's like, There's something inside of me, man, you know, and I want to stay with you, you know, I, I you know, I want to stay with you, Grady. And it's like, You got a woman who's waiting for you, man, and it's like, No, I want to stay with you. <laughs> so you get that kind of thing, you know, that definitely homoerotic subtext. That little that little bit didn't bother me. It's just the S and M stuff. I didn't I didn't want to deal with Coach Schneider getting seeing his bare ass get whipped by a wet towel. I didn't need to see that. I didn't need to see the scene where Jesse sleepwalks into an S and M bar. I didn't need to see that either. Uh, That's just me personally. Um, and I also thought the film and then this is definitely a screenplay problem. It just it just had too many moments of just this silly goofy shit. I mean, like, the fucking bird that flips the fuck out and then bursts into flames. It's just stupid. Even the filmmakers admit that was just dumb. And they actually even had, like, a makeup effects artist guy build, like, a demon parakeet and puppet. And then it's like, no, let's not go with that. We'll just go with a regular parakeet. Which is just... Even they admit, like, that was just some goofy-ass shit. And then it continues with the stuff where he goes to the... Lisa goes to the boiler room... You know, in in the steel steel mill, I think it's a steel mill, and and you see like dogs with what looks like baby heads, which just looks fucking stupid. They look like they just put like cabbage patch kids heads on these dogs. It's it's not it's supposed to be surreal, but it, it's just laughable. It's not scary at all. The giant rat and eats a cat or something or whatever the fuck. I don't know what it did. I don't care. It just looked out of place. And it was trying to be surreal and try to keep and try to. It was almost like it was trying to capture the nightmare sort of dream sort of surrealness that it, that uh, Nightmare on Elm Street films are known for, but trying to do it with just 
weird stuff that doesn't make any sense because I thought Lisa wasn't really dreaming. She goes into the the boiler room, you know, the steel mill. Why the hell is she seeing all these weird ass shit? That she's not in a dream, is she? It's not really established that she's in a dream, so it just yeah, and that that, that bothered me. I also thought the care supporting cast, other than Lisa, Grady was there. Robert Russell did a good job of the performance, but the film with the screenplay was really not very good in that regard in terms of building up his character. Because he starts out pantsing Jesse, embarrassing him in class while he's sleeping, we're putting a snake on his on around his neck. And then the next couple scenes later they're buddy buddy, and I'm like, where did this come from? There was absolutely no build up to their friendship. It made no sense. So when he dies, it just kinda like, yeah, it was a really brutal death, and I did feel for him, but at the same time I don't buy why they're friends. Uh, it'd be like, I, I've been bullied by the same sort of jock guys in school. I didn't become friends with those guys. I, those guys were still assholes. <laughs> uh, we didn't become buddies afterwards. I, I don't really get that. And then you have Lisa's friend who's just there, not really much of anything. And then I didn't really care for the parents, especially Kul Gulerger's character. Uh, he was a terrible character. He was a skeptic. Just for this, for skeptic's sake, it was to the point. It was just stupid and ridiculous. It was just a moron. See a bird fly in the air out of nowhere and burst into flames, and he's trying to come up with a logical explanation. It was bad seed. No, it was your fault, Jesse, with the cherry bombs. I'm like, no, it's a fucking that. None of this. That's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. Jesse's dad. A bird just free, flipped the fuck out and lit on fire. That's a supernatural occurrence. And Jesse's trying to warn him weird shit's going on. He's like, no, you know, this is, this is, this is, this house is fine. And then a toaster lights on fire. And then he looks and finds it's unplugged. And then he just, oh, how did that happen? It's unplugged. I don't know, fucking weird shit. Ghosts and fucking sh Come on, man. Freddy's ghost or somebody or something. There's some weird shit going on in your house. And you should stop being like, oh, well, there's a logical explanation to it. No, there isn't. It was, the toaster wasn't plugged in and it lit on fire. And there's no such thing as bad bird seed that makes birds burst into flames. But, yeah, it's just me. I just... I don't like that character. Just stamp the word idiot on his forehead. I have expected him to get killed off because he was such a dumb character. Uh, <laughs> his, his mother's heir, the sister, not much, you know. There was a good, really, uh, kind, of, kind of really suspenseful, uh, tense scene where it looks like Freddy's going to kill the girl, but then, you know, it's Jesse who's under the influence of Freddy. And he's almost about ready to do it, but doesn't do it. Yeah, I like that. And I like the cereal that she eats too. It's called Fu Manchu's. Like it's so corny, but it's so fun as well. Like you try, I'm trying to find the Fu Man fingers. Uh, but so that's that's a little bit of silliness I didn't mind because it was it was just a little little thing. But fucking weird, goofy ass birds and goofy ass. Dogs with baby heads and shit. Just, no, please. Refrain from that. that. That's that's one problem I definitely have with the screenplay. It's just it tends to be too silly for its own good. But um but yeah, the basic gist of the plot is Jesse moves in with his family into the night of the same house that Nancy Thompson lived in, and he's starting to have these dreams that might be related to Freddy. And then he starts becoming more and more affected by Freddy's presence to the point where he finds the Freddy glove and he wears it and puts it on. And then he goes in and I think the first kill he does is he kills Coach Snyder under the influence of Freddy Krueger. And he has the dream sequences where he dreams of Freddy. And of course he had the memorable sequence where Freddy, and it could make him effect where he pulls back his skull, you know, after he says, you know, you got the body, I've got the brain. You know, you know, so I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, and then later in the film, as it goes on, about literally about an hour into the film, that's when at first really Freddy starts to fully take over Jesse. And uh, about maybe 50 minutes to an hour. And you have a fun sequence where Freddy goes and attacks people at the party. I, I didn't, I didn't, 
I liked it. I, I thought it was brutal. It was it was in, intense. I'm afraid he's just gutting people. I like the scene where this one guy, after he's just killing all these people at the party, and and this one guy just stops. And he's like, "Hey, hey, hey, hey! It's all right. It's okay. We're not here to hurt you. We just want to help you, man. Just want to help you. Just calm down. We're here to help." I love, I love how, I love how Freddy just looks at him like, what the fuck? And then just, then, then he just says, help yourself, fucker. And it just stabs his ass. I love that. That's one of my favorite scenes in the film. It was like, help yourself, fucker. <laughs> it was just so absurd to have this guy, hey, hey, talking to like Freddy, who looks like he's a fucking demon from hell. He's got like blades on his coming out of his fingers, and the guy's like, "Hey, it's okay, it's all right, yeah, help yourself, fucker." <laughs> I love that. And then I love the scene, of course, where he makes the the knocks the grill off, and then the flames are burning, and then he's standing behind the burning flames, and he's like, "You are all my children now." So I thought that was a really uh, good line of dialogue and a memorable sequence. And I, I I also caught how that and when the craziness go on, Freddy's just gutting people at the party. There's one guy who gets killed, not by Freddy. It's by one of the partygoers. They step on his neck. So that was a nice uh, little touch that they threw in there in that sequence. I also really like the soundtrack for the most part. I mean, not only Christopher Young's score, but I like the music that they use, especially the song "Whisper to a Scream" by uh, Bobby O. You know, from a whisper to a scream, I know just what you mean. From a whisper to a scream, I know I love you. Oh, a whisper to a scream, I know just what you mean. You know, it's just a really catchy, fun uh, dance tune. Um, and so... Yeah, so of course, you know, while this is going on, then you have the whole core of the, 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 the heart of the film is the relationship between Jesse and Lisa, which is a burgeoning relationship, and it has a scene where he's trying, he's making out with her, but then he, he gives up, and of course, this tongue, because this Freddy, disgusting Freddy tongue comes out, it looks pretty phallic, uh, comes out, and then he leaves, and then... And then he becomes Freddy, and then kills the people at the club, and then Lisa goes and tracks him down. And uh, before that, before even the, the scene where he's not really at the club, he attacks people at this party, pool party. And there's a, then before the pool party massacre, there's a pretty tense sequence where, you know, Freddy is taking over Jesse, and Lisa is, is like, no, I love you, you know, it was like, you, you, you know, Jesse, you know, it's like, Jesse's dead, you know, and it was pretty, it's sad, I mean, think about it, like, if, if, if you, you're, you're loving someone, someone you love, and they've turned into something else, and you're trying to get the person that you love back, and it seems like there's no hope, and, uh, eventually, though, there is enough, because she tracks him down to the steel mill, and, uh, she ends up through the power of love, as sappy as it sounds, I actually like it because I think the film hand handles that aspect pretty well. She manages to save Jesse's soul and and defeat Freddy. She kisses Freddy, you know, and says, "I love you, Jesse. I love you." And uh, and then Freddy bursts into flames, and Jesse emerges from Freddy's ashes, which I thought it was a nice touch. It was he, he rose like the phoenix from the ashes. Uh, I could do without the stupid dogs, the baby heads, and all that kind of stuff, stuff. But, you know, hey, you know, it is what it is. But, after you build up all that, you build up this great relationship between Jesse and Lisa, and and you, and they went through hell, then you have a stupid shock ending, which just fucking pisses me off, and really brings the film down quite a few notches just by itself. Because the film opens up with a bus nightmare sequence, which I... I'd be remiss if I didn't mention because I actually really like that sequence. I think it's a really well done sequence, well shot, low budget, but the practical effects actually looks really impressive for such a low budget. I really like the sequences, you know, where the the ground breaks apart and the buses are just the buses are just hanging on a precipice on these two little rocks. I really like that sequence, and um, 
But then the film decides to end with a bus nightmare sequence as well, which I'm like, why do we need to do that? So it, it makes it look like it's all over and Freddy's dead for the time being and Jesse's been saved and and then fucking Freddy showed claw burst through the well, one of his friend's chest and then the bus goes out of control and drives off the road like it did in the beginning of the movie Freddy laughs and then it's the end of the movie and you're like oh why why do we have to have another shock ending I mean I was all right with it in Nightmare on Elm Street it didn't bother me that much but doesn't mean I wanted it done again in Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2. So, you know, I didn't need another shock ending. Especially one as cheap and as lazy and as fucking lame as a shock ending in Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2. Uh, but yeah. I really don't want to say about the film except I like the movie. I, I do. I think it's above average movie. I like the good performances. I like Mark Patton. I like, uh... I like the actress who plays Lisa. I like Kim Myers. Robert Russell is there, but... A lot of the supporting characters I don't really care for that much. The direction is really great, but the writing is uneven. It has problems with tone. It's trying to be really dark and gritty and violent. And then at the same time, fucking birds are flying around, bursting on fire in flames in the middle of the air. You know, it's really, it doesn't know what tone it wants to stick with. And that just bugs me. Uh, I, I really... I really like a lot of the stuff about the film, though. I like Freddy. I like Freddy. I like Robert Englund and the few scenes that he's in. He does a really good job. I like the whole aspect of him taking over Jesse, and I like the way they handled it. Um, there's a little bit too much of homoerotic subtext at moments for my taste, but I like a little bit that a little bit of it that's there. Uh, the, there's a little bit that I like. The rest, I don't like all of it, but there's a little bit that I do. I don't mind. I thought the nightmare sequences, for the most part, were pretty forgettable. I mean, yeah, they had they threw in some nightmare stuff and they threw in some dream stuff, and I mean, just the stuff with Coach Schneider's death that was pretty, you know, unmemorable to me. It's just a bunch of sporting equipment comes to life. He gets tied by down by some rope, jump rope, gets whipped with a wet towel, and this, you know, we get to see his bare ass, which is a sight no one wanted to see, and he gets scratched down the back, and that's pretty much about it. And then Jesse looks at his love. He's like, ah! Oh, because he's because he's a scream queen. Uh, but there's there's no problem. I don't have really have a problem with that because I would have screamed too if I realized that I fucking just killed some guy and had Freddy Krueger's glove on my head. And I'm in the middle of a fu I'm fucking wet and I'm in a shower somewhere. I'm in the showers at the school and I just fucking killed my coach with Freddy Krueger's glove. Uh, I'd be screaming too. Um, but anyway, and then the other dream scene was like, he's dreaming and like his room is so hot that shit's melting and it looks really cheap and, and you know, and then the other lame shit and then in the steel mill and all that and so forth. But in out of the, all the whole franchise, I'd probably say this has the most unmemorable kills, but it doesn't mean they're bad. I like the kill, the great, the scene uh, with Grady and, and the stuff with the, at the pool party. It just means that they just don't have the ingenuity that the other films do because they have the the benefit of the dream world in their favor. This film doesn't have that. So um, the, the kills are definitely more like just a traditional slasher. Um, but I didn't mind that. It's just they are the most memorable because you know they don't really have the benefit of the dream world. Um, but... Yeah, I, I think it's just the mainly the main things that that make the film not work entirely for me are, are the tone and and some really silly goofy ass you know sequences that try to be scary but just fall flat on their ass and the stupid shock ending and, a, and I don't like the S and M stuff. But other than that, that's I like the film. I do. That, that's why if I was to rate it out of five stars, I give it three and a half out of five. I don't think it's one of the worst horror sequels out there. The way worse. Nightmare on Elm Street Part 5 is every one of them for me, or the remake, or or Halloween 5, or 6, Resurrection, Hellraiser Bloodline, or the Friday the 13th Part 8, Jason Takes Manhattan. Those are all worse films to me than a Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2. But anyway, I have little else to say about the film, except thank you for watching my review of a Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2, Freddy's Revenge, and I will see you guys later. See ya.